Most fitness trainers and strength and conditioning professionals stretch their clients and athletes. Clients and athletes should also be placed on a proper flexibility training program to balance flexibility around each major joint. To know as objectively as possible where the individual is tight, normal, or hypermobile, the coach needs to learn their joint ranges of motion and assess them. Otherwise, a flexibility training program is designed either based on guesses and assumptions or on where the person subjectively feels tight, which isn't an effective program. Unfortunately, this is what is occurring more often than not in the fitness field. The suggestions in this article from 2019 on measuring range of motion closely mimic what I'll suggest in this video. As the authors note, smartphone apps such as the Clinometer app can be used to help measure joint range of motion. The authors also note that coaches don't possess the palpation skills that a rehab professional possesses, nor are they skilled in using digital inclinometers and goniometers. This doesn't negate the need to perform a joint range of motion assessment. It only means that there will be a little more subjectivity to the assessment. As you'll see in this video, reasonable accuracy can be obtained just by drawing plumb lines with your eyes, and it's also important to note that the primary purpose of this assessment is to get a general idea of where the person is tight, normal, and hypermobile. Perfect objectivity isn't necessary, and even rehab professionals aren't getting perfect objectivity in their assessments. There is always a small window of error. With all that said, let's get started. I normally begin at the foot ankle complex and work my way up the kinetic chain. Beginning at the great toe, it's just a matter of placing your hand at the base of the toe and then gently pushing the toe into dorsiflexion. Normal range of motion is 70 to 90 degrees. So with your eyes, you create a 90 degree plumb line or right angle and then see how close the toe gets to 90 degrees. In gait, at the end of the push-off phase, we need about 70 degrees of great toe dorsiflexion. And when descending into the bottom of a lunge, the back foot needs nearly 90 degrees of dorsiflexion. Conditions like arthritis, hammer toe, turf toe, or even just general tightness can limit range of motion. If you don't assess it, you won't know it exists. The problem is that the person will only be able to reach the depth that their toe will allow them, and then during a lunge, they'll begin to shift forward in space, which increases stress at the knee and the risk of injury. So we need to assess great toe joint range of motion. Moving up to the ankle, there are three things you need to assess, and they are all pretty simple. First is ankle dorsiflexion. Normal range of motion is about 20 degrees. With your eyes, draw a plumb line at 90 degrees. Half of that is 45 degrees and half of that is 22 and a half degrees. That's your point of reference. Support the heel and push the foot into dorsiflexion to see how close the person gets to 20 degrees, or if they're hypermobile at the joint. If they lack range of motion, you'll know you need to add calf stretches and possibly ankle mobility drills to the flexibility program. Depending on how tight they are, it may also affect their form in a squat or lunge. So when watching them perform those exercises, if they're negatively affected, you already know what one of the primary correctives is, improve ankle mobility. Next is assessing range of motion in the frontal plane, which is side to side movement. First assess inversion where the sole of the foot is being tilted towards midline. Normal range of motion is about 35 degrees. So it's as simple as drawing a 45 degree plumb line with your eyes moving the foot into inversion to at or near the end of the range of motion, knowing that they should get about 10 degrees shy of that 45 degree mark. If they go past 35 degrees, which is fairly common, especially with people who have suffered multiple ankle sprains, single leg balance exercises should be part of their program to improve isometric strength and stability at their foot ankle complex. Last is eversion, where the sole of the foot is being tilted away from midline. Normal range of motion here is very small, only about 15 degrees, so it's a small movement and easy to assess. Moving up the chain to the knee, normal range of motion is about 140 degrees. Place the knee at a right angle, which is 90 degrees. 
adding 45 degrees to that is 135, and you want to see if they can go just past that. This will give you an idea of whether or not tightness or knee pain will affect their squat depth before you ever even see them squat. From there, go straight into hip flexion with a knee bent. Normal range is about 120 to 140 degrees. Begin with a hip at about 90 degrees. Adding 45 degrees to that is 135, and they should be somewhere within that range. Lack of mobility means tightness in their glutes, which will help you with creating a flexibility training program, and will help you with a corrective if they go into butt wink too early in the squat. Next is hip flexion with the knee almost straight, but not completely locked out. Here you're assessing hamstring flexibility. Normal range of motion is about 90 degrees at the hip and about 5 degrees of flexion at the knee. I place my hand just above their kneecap and my thumb just behind the knee to create about 5 degrees of flexion and then move towards 90 degrees. Most people are tight here and need to stretch their hamstrings. Even though the literature says 90 degrees is normal range, I prefer that people have a little more than that, like 95 to 100 degrees because they'll be at lower risk for low back pain and hamstring strains, and it'll be easier for them to get in a proper setup for deadlift variations. After this is hip rotation. Normal range of motion with hip external rotation, with the hip positioned at 90 degrees, is 90 degrees. This means that the shin should end up parallel with the belt line. Most people are tight here as well. The muscle being put on stretch is the piriformis, and it's important to have normal range of motion in this movement because tightness will increase the risk of low back pain and piriformis syndrome. Keeping the hip positioned at 90 degrees, normal range of motion with hip internal rotation is about 45 degrees, which is an easy plumb line to create with your eyes. Tightness in this range can increase the risk of low back pain. Hypermobility can increase the risk of dynamic valgus when landing from a jump especially single leg landings. These are all reasons why we need to perform these assessments. The knowledge you'll gain significantly helps designing safe, effective programs. After hip rotation comes hip abduction. Normal range of motion is about 45 degrees, which is another easy plumb line. Just make sure the thigh doesn't rotate outward during the assessment. Here you're assessing groin flexibility and a lot of people have tight groins, especially men. For ease of movement and to lower the risk of low back pain and knee pain, it's extremely important to have good groin flexibility, which underscores the need to assess this. I also assess this with the knee bent by putting myself into a position where I'm facing away from the individual, lean back slightly into the leg that isn't being assessed to help stabilize it, and then dropping their knee towards the ground or table. The knee should drop until it's about 10 to 15 degrees from the ground or table. This assesses upper groin flexibility. And then finally at the hip, I assess the hip flexors. With most people, I'll use the Thomas test as my assessment, where I'll have them lie down on a table with their butt at the very end of the table, tell them to lie back completely so that their head is on the table, and then have them pull one thigh in towards the torso at about 45 degrees past a right angle. The purpose of this is to place the low back and pelvis in a neutral position so that you'll get an accurate assessment. And then you just tell the person to completely relax their leg and knee. You'll want to make sure their thigh is hanging in about 10 or 15 degrees of extension. If it's not, they'll need to stretch their upper hip flexors to improve range of motion. The knee should also be hanging naturally at about 80 to 90 degrees. If that's not the case, they're going to need to stretch their quadriceps to improve range of motion. If they're not able to perform a Thomas test, another option is to have them lie face down, bend their knee to about 90 degrees, support their pelvis so that all the movement comes through raising their thigh and none of the movement comes through any tilting of the pelvis. Place your hand underneath their thigh or grab their ankle and raise the thigh up off the table to see if they can extend it about 10 to 15 degrees. Once you're finished the hips, which really doesn't take that long once you get used to it, it's time to move up to the spine. The spine can flex, extend, rotate, and laterally bend. 
out of those four movements, I always assess rotation and extension, and I'll assess flexion as long as the person doesn't have any low back issues. Starting with rotation, place the person on a table and have them squeeze something between their thighs, like a foam roller. The purpose of this is to lock their pelvis and low back so that all the movement is coming from the thoracic spine. Normal range of motion is 45 degrees, another easy plumb line to create with your eyes. Have the person rotate as far as they comfortably can, take one deep breath, and as they're exhaling, try to get a little more into the stretch. It's important to have good thoracic rotation for low back health. Then I assess thoracic extension, which is extremely important for low back, shoulder, and neck health. I'll place them on a table with their knees up and feet down, which is called a hook lying position, and have them extend over a rolled up yoga mat or a half foam roller. It's probably best to start off with something like a yoga mat and progress to a foam roller when a yoga mat is no longer challenging for the person. They should also support their head and extend their spine slowly over whatever the prop is. And the prop should be placed so that it's approximately across the middle of their shoulder blades. If this isn't easy for the person to do, the assessment can also be used as a stretch within their flexibility program. If the person has no low back issues, flexion can easily be assessed with a toe touch. You can either use the standard toe touch where they are cued to relax their spine, allow it to flex, and slowly reach their hands towards their feet while simultaneously slightly bracing their core to help protect their low back. Or they can perform a unilateral toe touch, which is a little easier on the low back, by keeping one leg straight and the other knee slightly bent and then reach down only towards one toe. Normal range of motion would be the ability to either touch your toes or come within a few inches. The next joint to assess is the shoulder. I always start by assessing shoulder flexion, and if the person is able to, I have them lie on top of a half foam roller. This is only for the purpose of elevating them above the table a few inches, and it's only for the first two shoulder assessments. Then I'll have them move both of their shoulders into flexion at the same time, looking to see if they can get to 180 degrees of motion, which means their biceps should end right beside their ears. If the person suffers from a shoulder condition, I may not have them perform this assessment, or I'll tell them to move through it very slowly and stop as soon as they feel discomfort. I'll also move around to the person's feet and watch the assessment from that angle, telling them to move just one arm at a time. Here I'm looking to see if both arms are moving symmetrically, or if one arm is compensating by showing some apprehension through the movement, not getting as far into the movement as the other side, or not ending with the bicep right next to the ear. I'll also get their feedback to let me know if they feel any clicking, or what type of discomfort they feel, if there's any. This will let me know if I need to avoid overhead movements, at least in the beginning of the program. Keeping them on the half foam roller, the next thing I assessed is horizontal shoulder abduction. Normal range of motion in this movement is about 135 degrees, which they won't be able to get because the table will block them at about 100 degrees or so. But this is okay because in a chest press or a chest fly, you don't want the person to go deeper than about 100 degrees because it puts unneeded stress on the shoulder capsule. So I'm purposely using the half foam roller as a way to see if they can comfortably abduct to a little past 90 degrees with no pain and little to no stretch in their chest. Then I take the foam roller out from underneath them and assess their shoulder abduction. Palms should be facing the ceiling and the person should be cued to move their arms in a half circle so that their bicep ends of their ear keeping the back of their arm against the table the entire time. If they aren't able to keep their arm against the table, or if they can't move through the entire 180 degree normal range of motion, it will let you know if you need to avoid movements or exercises like loaded lateral raises, at least initially. Finally, I'll assess shoulder rotation. 
Urso asked them to shift their body towards the side of the table and relax their shoulder. I'll start with internal rotation. Normal range of motion is 70 to 90 degrees without their shoulder shifting forward in the socket, which means that you'll have to keep your eye on that. As soon as the shoulder starts to shift forward, that's the end of their range of motion, and you'll want to terminate the movement. If they have normal range of motion, their forearm should be able to move to at or near parallel to the ground. Then I'll move them into external rotation. The literature says normal range of motion is about 90 degrees, but I prefer that the person is able to go a little past this. And if the person is a throwing athlete, they'll need to be hypermobile in this movement and get to at least 120 to 130 degree range of motion. The last joint to assess is the cervical spine or neck. This is optional unless the person suffers from neck pain, then it's something that should be assessed. I have them sit comfortably on a stool or chair and tell them to sit with perfect posture. The first movement I'll have them perform is to slowly tuck their chin towards their chest. Normal range of motion is about 50 degrees, so the coach should just use the person's nose as a point of reference, draw a 45 degree plumb line with their eyes, and then view this movement from the side to see if they can go a little past 45 degrees. Then, maintaining their posture, I'll have them look towards the ceiling, which is cervical extension. Normal range of motion is 60 degrees, about 15 degrees past that 45 degree plumb line. Then I'll have them move their head back into a neutral position, looking straight forward, and then cue them to drop their ear towards their shoulder, which is lateral flexion. Normal range of motion is about 35 degrees, which is just shy of that 45 degree plumb line. Make sure you have them do this on both sides. And finally, I'll assess cervical rotation by having them rotate their neck slowly to each side. Normal range of motion is 70 to 80 degrees, which means the person should almost be able to rotate their head completely to the side. The purpose of the joint range of motion assessment is not only to determine where the person is tight, normal, or hypermobile, but it's also used to see how easily their joints move through each range, determine if there's any pain or apprehension, if there is, it's a red flag because they are at much greater risk of pain when they're performing the same movement under a load. So it'll give you a strong idea of what movements you may need to avoid, at least in the beginning of their strength training program. The assessment is also used to determine if there are any asymmetries. If there are, you'll want to emphasize the tighter side in the flexibility program by performing an extra set or two until it catches up to the other side. And finally, the information will give you a strong idea of how they'll move on the gym floor before you even see them move. If they have normal range of motion or some hypermobility, you'll know right away that you don't need to worry about any movement restrictions, and placing them on a flexibility program will be easy because they just need to maintain normalcy where they're normal and don't even need to stretch areas that are already loose. With tight areas, you'll have a strong idea of what restrictions they might have with various exercises like squats, deadlifts, lunges, or overhead press. You'll know what precautions or adjustments you might need to make. And most importantly, you'll know that placing those areas on a flexibility training program to increase joint range of motion will help correct any dysfunction they have. The final points I'd like to make are that it is part of our responsibility as professionals to know our joint ranges of motion so that the flexibility program we design will help balance movement around each joint, decrease or negate pain, and reduce the risk of injury. Learning joint ranges of motion is easy. Drawing plumb lines and performing an assessment is easy. And once you've practiced and become familiar with it, it only takes about 10 minutes. Those 10 minutes are worth every second for all the benefits you and your clients or athletes will get out of it. So please use this video as a resource to begin practicing this assessment on your friends or loved ones and then incorporate it into your profession. This is a missing link in the industry that we need to fix. Thanks for watching. Let me know if you have any questions and I'll see you in the next video.